Okay. Got it. <laughs> so um, this is, as I said, the next to the last presentation in the Functional Foods for Life educational program that has been created by the uh, Family and Community Health Sciences Department of Rutgers, University of Rutgers Extension. And as I said, and I, as I said in each, each uh, but I wanna go over it for the sake of the recording, that functional foods are foods that potentially have a beneficial effect on health when they're consumed on a regular basis and in um, certain levels. And actually all foods on some levels are functional because they, most foods, I wouldn't say all foods actually, because most foods have some minerals or, or some micro or macronutrients that are helpful for us. Um, but these, what we're talking about with functional foods is, is things other than those um, normally, uh, that, well, those things that we, that, we, that we know pretty well. And there is no legal or accepted definition, which means that they're not regulated by the government. And so any claims made um, are not regulated by the government. And actually we're, bless you, we are totally focused here on um, whole foods and, and or beverages, uh, not unsweetened beverages, regulated, with, not uh, no added sugar beverages. So, and, and as I said, berries, um, they're a real powerhouse. It, it's just really amazing. So let me, okay, there we go. All right. So um, the objectives are to increase that, which are pretty much the same for all the others that I've done, which is to increase the knowledge about berries, including the historical processing and preparation facts, um, understand the current research and health benefits of berries, and identify the recommendations for including berries in healthful um, in a healthful plant-based diet. And that is always the evidence is plant-based diet. So blueberries, cranberries, and strawberries are actually native to New Jersey. Um, so we're gonna talk about them first. Um, and we're New Jersey is one of the leading producers of blueberries and cranberries. The cranberries I knew about, I don't know if I knew about the blueberries, so. Okay, so blueberries. Here's some interesting facts about blueberries. Um, in the early years of our country, blueberries were used as uh, herbal medicine. They were considered to have uh, um, health benefits or med medical, med medicinal type benefits. Uh, a tea from the roots was used to calm women during childbirth. And I don't know exactly what they mean by calm, but maybe just <laughs> relaxing or, or helping with labor. Native Americans, and by the way, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that Monmouth County is the traditional home of the Lenai Lenape Indians. So Native Americans, and actually they literally get mentioned in this um, uh, program because of course, we're talking about New Jersey. Native Americans believe juice and syrup made from blueberries could cure coughs, which is interesting because now we're very big on elderberry. Uh, which is related, I'll talk about it in a second. And elsewhere in the world, dried blueberries were used to treat stomach upsets, especially in Scandinavian countries. The elderberries are not really in the same family. There's a shrub tree and it's in the Sambucus family, whereas blueberries are an edible berry that's in the cowberry group. So, you know, there's a similarity amongst um, what nutrients they have in them that are beneficial, but they're actually not related. So. Okay, what's happening here? Whoop, there we go. Cultivation of uh, New Jersey berries. So New Jersey is known for the high bush blueberry and we'll talk, uh, there are two types, high bush and low bush. So it's known for high bush blueberries, um, which were developed in the early part of the 20th century. And this young lady is Elizabeth Coleman White, who studied the breeding of blueberries until 1954 in Whitesburg, New Jersey. And she assisted Dr. Frederick Coville, who was a USDA researcher. Um, and they were looking for sub superior blueberry plants from wild bushes, which are the low bush berries um, on the cranberry farm that her family owned and operated. And so they took thousands of cuttings and, and around 1916, they produced the first commercial crop of blueberries, which today is known as the high bush blueberry. So before that it was only wild blueberries. So they developed a cultivar that they called the high bush blueberry. And that was done in New Jersey. So wild blueberries, which are low bush blueberries, are one of the four fruit crops that are actually 
native to North America. They weren't brought in from anywhere else and they've always been here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. What, which, and I guess there are a lot of things that move back and forth as people move back and forth between the different between Europe and here. For instance, tomatoes were not native to Europe. They were native to this country. They were, so they, the explorers when they came here brought them back to Europe, but anyway. So wild blueberries are not planted, they grow wild. Um, and they've been around for over 10,000 years, believe it or not. Um, and until Dr. Coville and um, developed the, the cultivars, that's the only way that you could access them. So Maine is the largest producer of wild blueberries and also grow, they also grow in Nova Scotia, Quebec, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Islands, Newfoundland, and notice those are all in the northern part of the continent. So 90% of the crop is frozen. Um, only less than 1% is sold fresh, which is interesting. Um, and, and, that, and partially due to the fact that the low bush blueberries are more perishable than the high bush variety. So they need to be frozen almost immediately. So that's probably why they don't sell most of them unless they can immediately be um, purchased and eaten. So they froze, freeze most of them. Um, they're recommending that they, they're very small in size, but supposedly they're actually sweeter than the cultivated blueberries. So that is something that is interesting. So high bush blue are the cultivars. They're, just, they're deciduous perennial shrubs. Whereas, as I said, the low bush wild blueberries, they grow in the colder regions. They need a winter chill actually. Um, and they sprawl as they get mature. So along the ground and they're small and sweet. So, okay, blueberry facts. Let me just move this because my, oops, sorry. What are we doing here? Go back, there we go, blueberry facts. I just need to move this over because it's in the way. Okay, the US is the world's largest producer um, of all blueberries and over 690 pounds of cultivated and wild blueberries are sold annually. So 14 states produce blueberries, including New Jersey. Um, and Michigan is the top pro producer of the cultivated high bush blueberries. And Maine is the largest producer of the wild um, low bush blueberries. And actually the, the wild low bush blueberries, they harvest uh, up in Maine and in the, in, in the Northern part of the, of the continent, over 101 million pounds annually. So, um, but those probably mostly go into fruit and other, maybe the frozen blueberries we buy in the market. I haven't actually looked at those and I don't know if they're smaller, but. Judy? Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know, I don't want to interrupt you, but I have a question before we sure. get off of blueberries. Um, uh, yeah, I, I purchased two low bush blueberries when I was in Maine. Uh, several months back and uh, actually I buy the frozen wild Maine blueberries all the time. They are sweeter. They are tastier. Um, that's just a fact. That's good to know. So um, where do you, you get them in the supermarket or you get them yeah. somewhere? Yeah. In, yeah, I get them in, the, well, in, a, in a food co-op, but they sell them in all the big supermarkets. Wyman's, W-Y-M-A-N-S, Wyman's sells them by the wild, bag. Do they say wild low yes, bush mm -hmm. or wild? Oh, okay. Wild wild new uh, Maine blueberries on them yeah. and they're very small. Um, yeah, Barbara, do you? Uh, Trader Joe's has the wild Maine blueberries. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. It yeah. would yeah. figure that they would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah right, so that, that's okay. one thing. Um, the other thing is um, huckleberries. I have a niece in New Jersey, in uh, Montana. In, oh. They might, and they're, they're always picking huckleberries that look to me like blueberries, but I'm not clear if they're same or different. I think they're a little different. I don't know. I could check that out for you. They're not part of this um, right. pr presentation, maybe right. because they're not, I don't know, they're just not. And we're going to discuss, by the way, what is a berry and what isn't a berry later on. But I will look into huckleberries. My guess is it seems that most things that we call berries, that we eat berries, are fairly high in the things that we're going to talk about antioxidants and uh, in, in uh, phytochemicals and polyphenols that are that are antioxidant. And so huckleberries are probably the same. And if and I think that anything that you pick wild is better 
than things that are processed. Because even yeah. though most blueberries are not highly processed when you just off the vine, once you start processing things, they lose some of their food value. So, and then I was reading a book yesterday called The Copper Country, mm -hmm. and it is about um, copper mining in uh, in uh, Michigan, the Upper Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And they talked about something called thimble berries. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly. I've heard of them, but thimble, I thimble like the selling thimble. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know what those are, but I will um, research that also and get back to you. All right, all right. Well, that was that was okay. all of my <laughs> okay. questions. Thank you. Other, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Are you done? I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay. Other states, um, actually, Washington, Oregon, and Georgia grow them as well. So that's up in the Northwest. Uh, and July, in case you're interested, we just we just came out of National Blueberry Month. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, whoops, cranberries. Let me move this over again. So is, here are some interesting facts about cranberries. Um, they were used medicinally by the Native Americans, by the Lene La, Lenape tribe uh, specifically. And um, they realized that cranberries had healing properties and they used them to make herbal medicine. And yeah, cranberries are something that uh, Extension, uh, Rutgers Extension is doing a lot of uh, research on, and we'll talk about that in, a, in, in just a little bit. Um, they were also, they found that they were very hardy also, and they lasted a long time without spoiling, which made them a good thing to have during winter months and when other things weren't growing. And they were used to make something called pemmican, which is similar to a trail mix, which is sort of interesting. I guess trail mix is so basic. I, I imagine that, you know, it exists in one form or another in many cultures. Also, the, the bright red color, uh, and anybody who's spilled cranberry juice on something that they're wearing knows, um, <laughs> is, is really well, is really good at dyeing things, such as rugs and blankets. Um, now, here's another interesting fact. They're very high in vitamin C, and sailors in colonial times, they were really able, easy to transport in a, a um, barrel in water, and they mm. didn't spoil. So that, and you know, scurvy, which is due to vitamin C de de uh, deficiency was very common amongst um, sailors because they didn't have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables when they sailed. And so I guess they somehow realized by people were eating these berries or whatever, I don't know what the, what the mechanism was that they decided. So the sailors uh, would, would bring the cranberries with them because they were easy to, um, to uh, transport and, and they lasted a long time. And just, I know you've heard the term limey uh, uh, that uh, refers to an Englishman. I don't know if it's, it's derogatory or not, but the reason where that came about is because in the British Navy, they use limes to get their vitamin C. Mm -hmm. But as you know, if you've ever had citrus, it doesn't always last as well. So it's, the cranberries would probably last a lot longer. Okay. Have you ever had the pemmican? No, have you? Well, I've seen it. It's um, it's more like fruit leather. Oh, okay. It says it like trail mix. Well, that's interesting because that's a very different <laughs> thing from trail mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It's like pounded and dried. That and, makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. All right. So cranberry facts. Um, New Jersey is the second state to cultivate the cranberry. Massachusetts started cultivating them first. Now, overall production in the U.S. is down, and I could not find a really good reason for that when I searched it. But, you know, people mention climate change, they mention um, uh, loss of, of agricultural land and stuff. So for whatever, maybe there's less of a demand for cranberries, but overall production is down. And New Jersey, however, is the fourth largest cranberry producing state. And um, the largest producers in the US uh, after Wisconsin and Oregon, they produce more. And almost all New Jersey cranberries, this is interesting, are processed into juice or, unpro un or bleh, sorry, other cranberry products by companies like Ocean Spray. So in New Jersey, people don't guess, I guess, use them. I, mean, I guess they go into canned cranberry sauce, um, though you can find cranberries around the holidays. I just never looked to see where they come from and I will this year. <laughs> and October is National Cranberry Month. Okay. So harvesting cranberries. Um, so first, let me just go here. This is what cranberries look like before they fill the bogs. Um, now let me get back. Ah. Oh. 
should be a little arrow down in the lower left corner. You can put not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was saying to myself today that I really need to talk. We have a, a literacy and library, a, a computer literacy lab, and I really should probably stick my head in there and have them sit down and show me how to use Zoom better. Yeah. So the harvesting of the cranberries is an interesting process. So you saw how they grow in those fields. Um, and it's the first man-made bog was, that was ever constructed was in Burlington County. And that Southern part of the state is where they mostly grow. And they, they flood the fields with local streams or, and uh, ponds and reservoirs. And by the way, the water is recycled back um, into the uh, return to nature. They don't just, you know, it doesn't just let it, they don't just let it seep into the ground. So I could not find a public domain picture of the mechanical water reel that they say looks like a giant egg beater. It sort of did, which pulls the berries off the, off the stems and then they float to the top. And then they're, um, they have rakes and things and they, that will direct them even either by hand to go into these shoots and they just um, harvest them. And it's a pretty easy um, thing to harvest. Okay, so as I said, this is what it, the cranberries look like before they're harvested. So this is an extension program. Uh, so of course they're gonna talk about what they do and the Philip E. Marucci Blueberry and Cranberry Research Center in Chadsworth, Chatsworth, New Jersey in Burlington County is a substation um, of the New Jersey Agricultural Experimental Station and where they do a lot, a lot of research and a lot of the papers, especially the ones that come out about cranberries um, is based on research that comes out of this uh, substation. They do a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. And um, it's a USDA research service program. It was started as a, in 1918, actually, to focus study on cranberries, but it, they quickly added blueberries because blueberries became a, a, um, a product, a, a grown a, a, a crop, a, a large crop in New Jersey. And the, their goals are to ensure the continual production and availability of high quality blueberries and cranberries naturally. That would be one of their first things. Um, but um, they also want to minimize the use of pesticides in the culture of culturing of these two crops. And, and one of the things they probably look into is integrated pest management, which is a way to try and reduce the number of uh, the, the amount of pesticides and find other ways to protect the plant from disease. Um, they maintain research programs to study the health benefits of phytochemicals in cranberries and blueberries. And as I said, a lot of papers that are published come out of this uh, substation. And they also, of course, because it is, it's not just about um, uh, health benefits, they investigate causes and controls of diseases that affect blueberries and cranberries. And that sort of ties into their um, goal of, of, of using less pesticides um, in production. I have one, more, one more quick question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe you've never used that function where you quote, raise your hand. Do you see my hand? You can use it. Uh, it's not a problem. There, there are only three, four of us. Two, yeah, three of us plus me. So okay. this. Well, could be I, I I raised my hand, but I don't think you were looking at the screen. So. I probably was. <laughs> what okay. did you want to say? Oh well, I I want to find out about goji berries. We're going to get to those. We are going to be talking about those. So all right, coming Thank later. <laughs> all right, <laughs> under new under new berries. New mm -hmm. is not new, new. berry. But new yeah, yeah, berries. Yeah. Okay, okay. great. So strawberries are also native to New Jersey, which I didn't know, and they're in the rose family. And um, the, one of the subgroups of the rose family, which I can't pronounce, also includes blackberries, boysenberries, raspberries, and loganberries. So that's, mm. sometimes these things are all related in subgroups. You know. Anyway, they were used as a symbol of perfection and righteousness in medieval times. And their likeness was actually carved into altars in the church. Um, and they were considered essential to serve at governmental events, hopefully to promote, promote peace and also longevity. I mean, they were thought to be uh, symbols of that. And in Victorian flower language, the story was equated with absolute perfection. So obviously through the years that, that um, symbol of perfection stayed with the strawberry. In France, they were considered an aphrodisiac. Um, so newlyweds, newlyweds traditionally ate a strawberry soup, which I thought was amusing. Maybe it's true. Who knows? I don't know. Have you ever had Barre de Bois, a French strawberry? No. Oh my God. It is it's so different. good. It's different. Yeah, I'm it's sure that- Tiny, tiny berries, and they are the sweetest strawberries you've ever had. Mara de Bois, Marie I of the Woods. 
the smaller ones probably are more concentrated, which might be why they're, the, the sugar is more concentrated. It's, which it's a little different, but they're so good. Yeah, and it's probably a slightly different subgroup. Um, Native Americans actually held festivals and ceremonies in honor of the strawberry. So the strawberry was uh, considered, it was held in high regard. They were also used by Native Americans to season meat, make soup, and they made a tea from the leaves of the strawberry plant. We're gonna talk about other plant parts in a, in a moment. So um, strawberry varieties. Um, there are diverse varieties of strawberry native to New Jersey and um, also native to North and South America, Europe and Asia. So there's, it's somewhat versatile and, you know, Europe, um, obviously they're gonna be different types, as you mentioned, Anne, they're gonna be different types and different uh, strains of the, of, the, of the varieties. Some varieties thrive in cold, arid Andes mountains and others in hot, humid tropical areas. And I have to believe that they're, they have different um, qualities each, in each area that they grow, because I'm sure that the climate affects what's in what grows and what um, phytochemicals and other things that they have. Uh, different varieties have been crossbred by botanists to develop new varieties that were more productive and hardy. And um, commercial production actually started in the early 1800s. So this was an early one. And the New Jersey Wilson variety, which I assume is the one that we eat mostly in New Jersey, I don't know that for a fact, um, was released in 1860. And the Wilson strawberry was successful because it could stand up to being transported. Uh, uh, that is, you know, it, it, we talked about that with the bow bush wild uh, blueberries not being easily transportable because they're so perishable. So of course, one of the things they're gonna look for when they are developing uh, strains of these is something that's easily transportable. Um, and many other varieties have been developed in New Jersey. Okay, so some strawberry facts. Um, they're among the top top five most frequently consumed vegetables, uh, fruits, I'm sorry, which is not a surprise. I mean, uh, they're delicious and I, you, there are so many things that get made with strawberries. So. And uh, California actually grows about 90% of the nation's strawberries. Um, who, I don't know, somebody is oh, making noise, but anyway, <laughs> they're exported to over 30 countries and Canada receives the majority of our exports. And May is National Strawberry Month. And this is where we get into the interesting fact because strawberries are not really berries. And we're gonna talk about what actually is a real berry in a few slides on. Um, so now we're gonna talk about cane berries. They're historically known as brambles and that they include raspberries and blackberries. And they're increasingly called cane berries because brambles are deciduous and, and they, they are entangled and they're woody and they have um, thorns on them. So they want to sort of get away from that image of um, a cane berry. And um, so the name changes to get away from that negative idea, that negative connotation. Um, and cane berries also include Logan berries and boysen berries. So those are all uh, classified as cane berries. So, I mean, I call them blackberries, raspberries, but just so you know, the whole uh, uh, overall term for them uh, is agriculturally is cane berries. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to also, oh, Ann, thank you so much. This is so, it's Ann, you suggested that, but the, the arrows are so much easier. <laughs> so these are what Logan berries and boysen berries look like, which we said were also cane berries. And they do look similar to raspberries and blackberries. So it makes sense. Okay, so cane berry facts. Um, the Greeks and Romans, this goes back even further, um, had medicinal, medicinal uses as early as the fourth century, and they use them as an eye ointment, as a tea for dysentery, as a cough remedy. Again, it, you know, this, this is now we were saying that uh, the blueberries were used as a cough remedy as well. And we know that elderberry is also used in that way. Um, in childbirth, and they talked about blueberries being used in childbirth and to heal ailments of the stomach and throat. And they also said that about blueberries. So raspberries and blackberries also are not technically true berries. Um, we're gonna talk about that, as I said, in a few slides. They, they're aggregate, what's called aggregate fruit, which makes sense when you look at them, which is clusters of many individual sections, each with a seed. Um, the se individual se sections are called druplets and they can seed one, they contain one seed um, and they grow over a fleshy center. And you'll see that in just a second, a center core called the receptacle and are held together by tiny hairs, which 
you've seen, I've sort of seen those sometimes in these berries. Um, mm -hmm. If you've ever picked raspberries when ripe, each raspberry detaches from the receptacle. So the fruit has a cup-shaped cavity, and we're going to see that in a picture in a minute. Um, and that makes raspberries more fragile, which I, I, I really truly found. You know, they're very soft and they spoil pretty quickly and you have to be very mm -hmm. careful how you handle them and when you wash them. So they are a lot more fragile because they don't have that receptacle to help them keep structure. Um, so anyway, and with blackberries, of course, the receptacle comes with the blackberry. Judy? Yeah. Um, there's another berry that's probably in the same family called Marion berries. It and, might be, they, again, I'll look that up. They look very much like blackberries, but, and they they're might, found in, on the West Coast, particularly in Oregon. They might be in the caneberry. I'm going to look at that. They might be in the caneberry family. I, I, yeah, I think they just may be a different name in the in that region. <laughs> it might be. I'll look it up. I will get back to you on all these berries. Um, so raspberries and blackberries are, are grown. Oh, well, this is interesting. They're grown in Oregon, Washington, and California, and they produce, they produce the most. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to find out if the Marion berries are just another name, because obviously they, the most uh, raspberries and blackberries are grown on the West Coast. Right. Um, both fresh and processed berries. They're, and, you know, they're common to find at farm stands and pick your own farms. And also they get supplied to um, restaurants and foods because, you know, most of them otherwise go into production. And um, although we, we don't often see them, raspberries do come in different colors. So let's just look at this. So here are the different colors of the raspberries. They come in gold and, and red oh, and in a dark yeah. color. And you can see, whoops, sorry. You can see here uh, that the, that the um, uh, raspberry doesn't have the receptacle and the blackberry does. It's much more solid and uh, yeah. therefore more hardy. Okay, that explains it. Yeah, right. Yes, Claire. Hi, quick Was question. Yeah. Um, when I went to France, it seems like that they're, you know, they use raspberries for so many things like sauces and all of that. Right. Um, I thought they were, well, I know that they're imported over there, but I was just wondering if you had I any- I don't know I, that, but I could find that out. Um, okay. It just seems like that's a favorite berry. Well, it, they grow a lot of berries over there, but I'll find out. Um, oh, okay, if, thanks. If, um, they are imported raspberries but i've never seen the gold one <laughs> and you know and then you were talking about um <clears throat> strawberries the smaller strawberries in france that are a lot sweeter also so i think they grow berries over there and it, it, they, they, they did say that in mm -hmm. some of these berries and it, i'll find out for you though so i have I, a gold i have a gold bush they're they're very nice the gold ones do they have a different taste or well i don't know the one i have is <laughs> right. you know, from burpees and i bought it and planted it a couple of years ago and it makes a quite large, nice gold raspberry. Right, it's not probably nice in the garden for color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is gooseberries. And they were popular in, in uh, the history in Europe in, in the 1800s. And there were actually over mm -hmm. 700 varieties. Um, they have a unique flavor all their own, which wasn't really described, but uh, they're usually used in cooking and not eaten fresh. So I imagine they're tart. Um, and they have many small seeds at the center, which can be quite tart. So I imagine um, that's what the flavor all their own is. <laughs> it's probably not a really sweet berry. There are two main types, the American gooseberry and the European gooseberry. I, when I try to find pictures of each variety, they all look the same to me. So they, we, they go on to say that American gooseberries, which are found in the Northeast, North Central US, as well as Canada, um, are from a pink to dark wine color and they're small. They're about a half inch uh, across. And they're actually considered inferior to the European variety in flavor and for use in cooking. Now the, the European gooseberry is much larger, sometimes as large as a plum. And so they could be one inch in length and they can be green, white, yellow, or different shades of red to almost black. They're preferred for cooking and baking. And you know, if they're bigger, I, I, you know, I assume, I don't know, that they yield more. And apparently the demand for European gooseberries is currently growing. So I guess they're being imported in here. And here are pictures of gooseberries. But as I said, and these are the different, some of the different colors, mm. you couldn't really tell. I mean, there were some pictures where they did look bigger, like a plum, like a small plum, like a small purple plums. And some mm. of them, as, as you, you saw here, 
um, they they just like small little smaller berries, I think. So anyway, now we're going to get to currants. This was interesting. They're related to the gooseberry, and they do so look somewhat similar. As you can see, they look somewhat similar to the gooseberry. Um, and there are two distinct fruits, which are called currants, that are different. They, um, let me just go here. So on the upper right-hand corner, they're dried Zante grapes, which is a small grape from Greece in the US and the UK and Ireland. And it's dried like a small raisin and it's often used in baked goods, but it's not a true berry, but that is one type of currant. The other type of currant, and that also was pictured, uh, these uh, two picture, other pictures here, um, are, they are fresh tiny berry related to the gooseberry and it takes its name from the raisin like, I'm sorry, from the raisin like currant. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused as to, yeah. So that's a little bit different. Um, berries grow, as we see in pendulous chains of small berries, um, and each has three to 12 teeny bony seeds. Um, currants are either black, red, pink, or white. And they're used for jellies, juice, wine, pies, and sauces, where I think that the, the, the um, dried Zante grapes are the kinds of currants you see in baked goods, where they always, it looks like a little bit of a, a, a raisin almost. Well, it is a raisin. Well, it's a dried grape, so yeah, it's sort of a raisin. Um, they're also often mixed with other fruit. And red and white berries can also be eaten fresh. And black currants, um, so the red and white can be eaten fresh, and the black ones are used uh, to make cassis, the French liqueur cassis. Were you saying, did you want to say something, Anne? Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, you're muted. I didn't quite get that. The black ones are used Oh, for... I, they're used for the French liqueur cassis. I don't know is, what that is. Oh, it's, it's a fruity, it's like a liqueur. It's not a liqueur. liqueur. It's a liqueur. Yeah, yeah I, I've had it. And it has a very, very like, a very sweet, very like taste. How do you spell it? How do you spell it? C-A-S-S-I-S. -S -S. I think it's used in, I'm forgetting which mixed drinks it's used in. I don't know if it's, it probably it might be drunk. They might drink it by itself. But I know yes. that it is mixed in some drinks. Cool. And I can look what drinks. That's, that's okay. Nice. Yeah. And that's cool. I didn't know that. The dried little things that, like mini raisins, I didn't realize they came from a different, they came yeah. from grapes. So that's neither cool. Did, neither did I. So that, yeah, that was interesting. So as, as I said, here are the three um, different colors and there on the upper right hand side is the Sante grape. Okay, so now we're going to go to surprise, <laughs> a kiwi, which is a berry. And as we're going to talk in a, in a couple slides about what a berry really is, uh, yes, kiwis are berries. Um, and despite the fact they're big and they're fuzzy, um, it is a berry. And it was originally, now here's a, a little, 700 years ago, it was first found in China. It was originally called the Chinese gooseberry. So I guess they're related to the gooseberry. They were later introduced to New Zealand, which is where the kiwi came from. And then from New Zealand, they got imported into California. And the first major planting in this um, uh, country was in 1960. So. Kiwi grows on a vine similar to grapes. It's a vine-like shrubs that are deciduous, which I'm going to show you a picture of in a few minutes. It has very few enemies, so I don't, it's probably on the clean 15 of the environmental working group. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry so much about organic with this, uh, but it does require a lot of water. And it's grown in California, October through May, but it's also grown in the Southern hemisphere. So it's available all year round, but it seems like California, like with their almonds and now with their kiwis, they seem to use a lot of water and a lot they of the things they grow there. Yeah, they really, really do. So and it anyway. takes a male and a female plant to make them. Yeah, don't, mm. oh no, 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 right. Because in some they're just, uh, the, they just get pollinated by, uh... well, we'll talk about what, how, berries, what berries really are. And maybe that is why I did not look into that particularly, but um, that makes sense. Um, what was I gonna say about, oh, I was gonna show you, that this is what they look like growing. And it does sort of look like a, a, a grape, you know, grapevine. It does look like grapes. Also olives, I think olives grow like that. And olives, by the way, are a fruit. So I wonder if they're, no, they're not a berry because I don't know if olives are a berry. I have to find out because if they grow, well, we're we gonna see what the definition of a berry is and then we'll, we'll have to find out. So 
So that brings us to what is really a berry? Okay, so interestingly, botanically, berries are small fleshy fruits that usually have many seeds. And people and animals eat many types of berries and a true botanical berry is a single fruit that grows from one flower. And the easiest example of that that I know of, because I grow tomatoes, is tomatoes. You know, you get a flower and then um, in the center of the flower, after the, uh, the flower part, fall, the petals fall off, you see that a rounded receptacle center, whatever, and that grows into the tomato. And I thought that was fascinating because I just started growing tomatoes about seven or eight years ago and I had no idea. So um, it's a, a true botanical berry is a single fruit that grows from one flower. So that's blueberries, cranberries, currants, and ghost, gooseberries are all true berries. And, um, and so are grapes, bananas, tomatoes, and peppers. In it's the same thing as with tomatoes really being a fruit, we calling it a vegetable. So we call everything that we eat berries because they, the, the true berries are similar to the, to the fruits that are not really berries that are aggregate fruits. Um, but anyway, so most people call other fruits berries like blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, but these aren't true berries. They're, as I said, aggregate fruits or groups of little fruits that grow from one flower. So that's interesting. So the flat, instead of one um, berry growing from the flower, a lot of little fruits grow and aggregate together. Uh, mulberries are not true berries either. They are multiple fruits or fruits that grow from a bunch of flowers. Well, that's sort of redundant, but yes. Okay. So here's where we're going to now talk about, uh, and, and, you know, the bottom line is here is to enjoy a variety of berries, whatever, whether they're real berries or they're not berries, if they're called berries, because anything called berries has is very high in stuff that's really good for us. Mm -hmm. now, wait a second, what did I miss this? Oh, I know, no, no, I have a seat here. So super berries and, and enjoy a variety of berries for your various health, as I said. And um, what happened here? I got a little bit out of order here. Uh oh. Okay, so these are the, the new berries. Hold on. Am I missing a slide? Yes, I am. All right, so if you bear with me, I will find that slide. Uh, I want to talk about that. If you mean we should bury with you? Yes, you should bury with me. And I don't know how that happened. Oh, boy. Oh. All right, so hang on one second. You still got plenty of pretty slides here. Yeah, yeah. but I wanted to talk about these berries specifically. Um, because to tell you what each one of them is, so I will have to go back to my notes. Okay, well, you've got this one slide. This is so annoying. You've got the names of them right yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to the next slide. Okay. Um, with all my notes in it. Okay, so I'm going to read directly from this. So, um, so there's all these new berries that have come on the market. And I said new as the new berries. Um, and they claim to have miracle-like properties. Um, the acai berry is touted for its miracle-like health properties, as I said, and it's from Central and South America. Uh, but studies are needed to really show that the specific health qualities that are not present, that, that there are specific health qualities that are not present in other berries. And, and that's part of what's going on here. Is, so you also have the goji berry, um, which is also known as a wolf berry. And uh, they come from China and they can be purchased dried. I'm gonna show you what they look like in a minute or as a juice or as a supplement. And there is a recent study that has shown that uh, goji berries, although a good source of polyphenols, polyphenols, vitamin C, and therefore antioxidants, they're comparable to other berries. They're not, they don't have anything more yeah. than the other berries. But so, they Mm -hmm. They taste terrible. Oh, I haven't eaten any of them. So usually you put <laughs> them in things, I think, but I don't know. They will, what do they say about goji berries? Is it juice? Have you had, maybe you, a sweetened juice? I don't they're, know. They're used in a lot of smoothies and things like that. Right? Okay. Okay. You know, the goji berries. Store. Yeah, they throw them like the acai berries. I know they have these acai yeah. bowls and everything like that. So there's a newer berry on the scene. This one I hadn't heard of is the has cap. Um, Never heard of it. Neither have I. It's actually a honey berry, an edible blue honeysuckle berry. And I think they come from honeysuckle, a, 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 one of the honeysuckle 
a tree that's in the honeysuckle family. And Hascap is a Japanese name for the berry, and it means berry of long life and good vision. They're native to, <laughs> to yeah, they're native to Asia, Europe, and North America, and especially in Canada. And this taste is described as being tart, sweet, and juicy. So tart, sweet, and juicy, I don't know, like a raspberry, but I don't, I guess raspberries are a little bit tart. They can be a little bit astringent. Um, blackberries can be a little bit astringent. Mm -hmm. um, they actually, they actually have been found um, to possibly have a uh, a little bit greater um, what they call ORAC value or antioxidant value. But really, these berries are new on the scene. Um, it's it, it's going to be necessary to do a lot of studies. Uh, usually, <clears throat> the um, goji berry and the um, acai berries, yes, they have you know a lot of antioxidants, a lot of polyphenols, a lot of phytochemicals, but not that much more. Or they're very similar to other berries. Uh, the has cap might actually have some additional benefits. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so this is what they look like. Uh, you know, and you can, yeah, the, here's the goji berries dried up mm -hmm. and here's the acai berries and here's a has cap, which mm -hmm. looks, oh, you know, I mean. It, like I, blueberries. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. The, um, the goji berries grow like weeds. You gotta be real. I wouldn't plant them if I were you. I planted some and they just so. They just took over. <sighs> yeah, you have to see, that's the thing about um, native plants versus plants that we bring into this country, like kudzu, which was originally brought in from someplace right. else. And apparently in Florida, it takes over everything or other places. Mm. Too. But I, Is that a berry? Uh, no, I'm just saying that when you bring non-native plants oh, to plant. different countries, it, you know, there's, there can be problems with them. Yeah. Judy, so, yeah. Judy, mm -hmm. where where do these berries come from? Are they come are they not new berries, but they're new to us? They come from another culture. I am going to have well, the Haskat berry. I think does come from um, um, another culture, but I will have to research that for you. I don't know what which ones, and I'm missing my slide, which has all my notes. Well, I actually, just read the notes that they uh, um, gave, okay. but they're not really that extensive. But I will absolutely look into that and let you know whether they're actually. I'm just just curious because you know it doesn't seem like they're going to come out of nowhere. Well, you know. on the acai berry, I I want to say that might be cultivated in Hawaii, and I don't know why I'm saying that. Yeah. But, that, but let me look into that and and share that with you once I do the research on that. Okay. There's a lot of that. Um, I've heard it pronounced acai. Acai, okay, sorry. From Brazil. Oh, yeah, but okay. I, I'm not okay. sure. And I had some of it. Um, they made it into kind of this, almost like um, a smoothie kind of uh, consistency. Yeah, acai. Yeah, yeah, they do that and they have the acai bowls, which they have. Acai bowl and you put granola in it. That's right. the only way I had it. And some juice maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I'll do a little bit more research on that. Okay. Um, so all fruits, um, they're a great choice nutritionally because they're not that caloric. And we're talking about whole fruit, not, not juice, 45 to 60 calories per cup. And they do provide you with a feeling of fullness because there's a fiber and it's a good source of fiber. Um, you can see there, you, the, the uh, recommended daily uh, intake of fiber for an adult is 25 to 30 grams per day. So, you know, I usually eat a cup of blackberries at a time because I really like them. Um, so a, a half a cup of either blackberries or raspberries will have four grams. So if you had a whole cup, that's eight grams and that's a third of what you need. So you can get a lot of fiber. And in addition to polyphenols, berries are also a good source of vitamin A, vitamin C, E, and folic acid, and also have minerals like calcium, potassium, and selenium. And I just want to um, take a, a little bit of a, a segue into discussing glycemic index and glycemic load because mm. berries which aren't always don't always have a high glyce have a low glycemic index they have a moderate one and a glycemic index is the amount of sugar in the food that it, it compared to uh, they, they'll give it a, a score compared to how much it raises your um blood sugar compared to 100 um three ounces of glucose, pure glucose, that raises your blood sugar, that's considered 100. And everything under that is how close does that go? So mm. berries are, are, have a low glycemic index, but there's something called glycemic load, which takes into account 
all the other things in the berry or the fruit or the food besides just um, uh, the sugar. And berries tend to have a very low glycemic load. And the other thing I like to point out is like watermelon is a very big one, it's not a berry, but watermelon has a glycemic index of 72 and a glycemic load of four. And anything under seven with a glycemic load is considered good. That's because watermelon, there's so much water and so much fiber in watermelon that even mm -hmm. though the amount of sugar in a serving by itself would raise your blood sugar in concert with all those other things, um, it does not. So I just want to tell you also that, um, and, and my endocrinologist mentioned that to me. So and I know that's true anyway, because I looked at this. So berries are good if you have any blood sugar issues. Okay, so what's in berries that makes them so healthy? So phytochemicals, um, they're being studied for the potential health benefits in many different foods. And polyphenols are found in many plant foods and one of the main substances that are now being studied. And there are five major groups, um, and these are some of them. Uh, and the flavonoids is a large group of polyphenols with 14 subgroups, and they include anthocyanins, and that's things that gives berries their bright red, blue, and purple color. So that's a very big one in berries because a lot of them have that color. And they're the main substance along with flavanols responsible for the antioxidant activity in berries. And so each berry has a different makeup of substances and they're all being studied in different ways to determine their potential benefits. Um, and there are other things in the berries, the phenolic acids and other things that are also being studied. And the, the actual mechanism they feel is they have an antioxidant potential and antioxidants guard our cells from free radical damage um, and free radicals cause cell damage that then usually can lead to disease. Uh, they're also very high, um, as I said, in antioxidants. And, oh, well, that's, I'm sorry. Moving to the next line. Um, the antioxidants, um, wait, I've lost my train of thought. Well, antioxidants are, is, is measured, I'm sorry, this is where we go into it. I'm a little bit all over the place. The amount of antioxidants in food is measured by a, a test known as the oxidant radical absorbance capacity. And you might've seen that the ORAC value and the higher the ORAC value, the higher the <coughs> antioxidants. And berries are very top <coughs> that list. And the Hascap berries might actually have a higher ORAC value than either the goji or the acai. Um, and the other potential activities, um, and oh, also, was it blackberries? I think blackberries, raspberries, fresh berries, bl blackberries also have a very, very high, of all the berries have a very high auric value. Um, and they can also be anti-mutagenic, which means they would prevent the increase of mutation of cells. So therefore they could be anti-cancer. Um, they're antimicrobial, uh, they protect against infections. They're considered to be anti-inflammatory and that's the antioxidant quality. And the anti-inflammation is a very big, uh, underlying cause of mor uh, morbidities. Um, they also are, are considered to be neuroprotective. They apparently cross the, bra the brain blood barrier and um, they can reduce the risk of age-related neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So, you know, there's a lot here to unpack and I, there's just so much that they seem to, you know, cancer, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, obesity and diabetes, metabolic syndrome, gut health. These are all things that they can help with. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they, they decrease the risk. So we're gonna take a quick look at each, what time is it? And, um, I didn't think this was gonna go, but when I practiced it, it wasn't that long. Oh, so, well, you're getting a lot of interruptions because it's interesting stuff. So thank right. you. That's okay. But Anne, I know you might have to leave soon. I, so I really do. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. That's but... all right. I'm going to say Anne left at slide 34, so I will send you information from slide 30, and we'll also be it will also be uh, posting this on the YouTube channel. But I'll make sure you get this information. Thank you so much, Judy, and good night, everyone. Okay, good night, good night. Anne. Good night, Claire and Barbara. Okay. Bye. Bye. Take Bye. Care. So the high antioxidant potential of berries is directly related to their potential for providing protection against certain types of cancer. So here's where we get into this in vitro and in vivo research. So in vitro research is in the lab, in vivo research is with, with living organisms. So a lot of stuff 
they do test, they do a research in vivo, in vitro, and oh, look at this. This might have this quality. This might. And then when they start to do it in vivo, and this is not even with humans, this is with uh, lab animals. Um, they don't always prove to be true, so um, it doesn't always translate, uh, and that's why it's really important once they. Um, and that was one of the things that was going on for a long time. They would come up with these findings and, and they would trumpet them. The, the uh, journalists would trumpet them and say, oh, we found this. And basically they hadn't really tested them in living, in living beings, so they really didn't know. Um, but population studies, and this is epidemiological studies with large groups of people, a very large cohort for extended period of time, do suggest that diets high in berries may help reduce the risk of certain types of cancer and the anthocyanins in particular in blackberries. Um, they're thought to help reduce the incidence of esophageal, colon, and mouth cancer, so digestive cancers. And other studies also indicate that they inhibit the growth of cancer cells in breast, lung, prostate, uh, I, at colon, I said, and pancreatic cancers. Uh, and these, some of these cancers like lung cancer and pancreatic cancers <laughs> are difficult to um, diagnose in the early stages. So knowing that you have something that you might be able to eat that would keep them either slow growing or help them from developing it all mm -hmm. is good. So studies continue to look promising, um, but of course we need more um, studies with large groups of people. Um, now, oops, I just <laughs> missed the slide. Okay, so we just went over that. So heart disease. So berries work alone or synergistically working together with other things in the fruit, which is why fruit is sometimes better than juice, um, to protect against cardiovascular disease and large population studies um, showed the people with a daily intake of berries with anthocyanins, and I'm going to show you some that have that, uh, may be associated with heart health and studies. The Iowa, Iowa woman study, which followed 35,000 women for, 30, for 16 years, which is a fairly extensive period of time, they found that um, anthocyanins was related to a reduction in coronary heart disease and a reduced risk of dying from heart disease. Um, and another study 30, it showed a 32% de decrease in 100,000 um, women in the risk of having myocardial infarction or heart attack um, with a high intake of anthocyanins. So these anthocyanins are pretty important. Um, and other large studies have, with men and women have shown heart health benefits. Um, but and, and the protective effects might have to do with lowering blood pressure and positive effect on blood lipids. They really don't know. In other words, they know that eating these things causes a reduction in some of these um, morbidities, but they don't know what exactly is causing that, uh, what within the fruit. And that's why it's important to eat whole fruits because you really don't know. And, and, and there might be a synergistic thing going on with all the different elements. Um, so yeah, okay. <laughs> So just quickly, oops, let me go down here. These are uh, anthocyanin and berries and it, the range it depends on how much you eat, but these are berries with, um, which have a lot, are, are a good, there's a lot to be good sources of anthocyanin. So you notice elderberries are there, currants are there, blackberries are there, <laughs> strawberries are there. I don't see blueberries, but I think blueberries are on that list, maybe just a little bit lower. So, okay, neurodegenerative diseases. <coughs> so it, it's, uh, berries are associated. Is it okay if we go over a little, guys? Do you? Sure. Okay. I think we're already at eight o'clock. Why isn't this telling me what, where we are? Fit and 58, okay. So intake of berries is associated with healthy aging. We're almost done. And a degree, decrease in the occurrence of age-related diseases. Um, and cancer and, and heart disease are definitely age-related diseases, but so are neurodegenerative diseases. So they're found to have a positive effect on the brain and can lead to protective um, protections against these neurodegenerative diseases. And they do this by maybe uh, to, to promoting blood flow in, in the area of the brain. And um, they are able, they feel they must be able to cross the blood-brain barrier, which is a very important thing in any uh, substance that's going to help with neurodegenerative diseases because if it doesn't cross the blame, bl blood brain barrier, it's not going to be effective. Um, so they're not sure if this is what's going on, but they do feel that it probably is, and they're going to have to have more specific studies to confirm that. Um, they also may, they, the antioxidants might actually even be able to reverse damage due to stress on the central nervous system. 
And most research looking at neuroprotective roles of polyphenols in vitro, which is not with living organizations, uh, living organisms. Um, and most studies are with in, 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 in vitro because in vivo it is expensive and um, it's difficult, but these are the kinds of studies we need and that need to be funded. Um, blueberries have also been shown to have a neuroprotective um, uh, ability due to the high polyphenol content. And one uh, interesting finding from research was the leaves of the blueberry. And then we're talking about way back when the leaves of the strawberry having been used for tea uh, and that in, in uh, back in Europe in the, well, I guess it was before the 1800s or whenever, um, and it found to be, uh, they felt it was had medicinal values. So they found that, um, that um, I'm sorry, where am I? That the, yeah, the, the leaves also tend to have some phenolic compounds. So they want to do more research to find out now, well, is it just the berry? Is it other parts of the, of the, of the um, fruit that have um, protective benefits. So this is definitely an area for additional future research. Okay. And just the other health benefits. We talked about um, the studies of flavonoids and berries have shown a possible connection with promoting a decrease in the risk of type two diabetes, insulin response, lipid levels, and overweight and obesity. And all this could help um, protect against metabolic syndrome, which is defined as having one of three or all, either large waist circumference, high blood pressure, high fasting blood glucose levels, high triglycerides and or low HDL cholesterol. So those are the things that contribute to metabolic syndrome. Um, and then with that, there's an increase in the risk of diabetes and heart disease and polyphenols and berries may contribute to gut health by providing a source of prebiotics also that could support the growth of beneficial bacteria. So just prebiotics or compounds in the food, because I know they have prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics. Prebiotics are compounds in food that cause the growth or activity, um, that cause the growth or activity of beneficial bacteria in your gut. And the most common example is in the gastrointestinal tract where prebiotics can alter the composition of organized in the gut microbiome to more healthy gut microbiome. Probiotics, of course, is the, the live organisms in the gut. And you, of course, want to do anything to improve gut flora, the healthy gut flora. And postbiotics are also known as um, metabiotics or biogenics or simply metabol um, metabolites. They're the food for the, for, the, um, for the bacteria that's in your gut. And they also make uh, short chain fatty acids, which um, help maintain intestinal barrier integrity. And that's the, pro the postbiotics. So in addition, polyphenols and berries have been found to protect against inflammation, ulcers, and infection. I know I'm whizzing through this. Um, any questions about any of that? Because I just whizzed through it. Um, so I think with the metabolic syndrome, by lowering um, your blood glucose, by lowering uh, lipid levels, uh, thinking that mm -hmm. possibly uh, that is what contributes uh, to, and the anti-inflammatory, anti-ulcer, and anti-infective um, properties are what's important there. So, okay, so just quickly, um, huh? The, the, were you gonna say something? No, 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 I didn't have any questions. It, you know, it's a lot of info and I can always go back and we can always go back yeah, and, and you can pick it up. And I'll show you the background information. If anybody has yeah. any questions, email me. That I just whizzed right through. Um, and I didn't, I don't know if I was as specific, that, uh, you know, but I'm just saying that studies have found. And when they say studies have found, as I said, most of them are in vivo. I mean, in, in vitro, not in vivo, but they mm -hmm. do have some of these epidemiological studies, which are showing that berries do contribute to um, decrease in neurodegenerative, in, in neurodegenerative diseases, decrease in um, heart disease and uh, decrease in metabolic syndrome. They, I don't think they know quite always what the mechanism is and they're still studying that. Again, most mm -hmm. of the studies are in vitro, which means in the, in, in the lab. And it isn't until they start doing in vivo studies that they find out with, whether or not what they, the research they did in the lab is actually applicable to living organisms. So just quickly, uh, my plate, um, just put in a little bit of a plug for my plate, which is really not bad as far as it goes, just doesn't always go far enough. And so it says to fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables. And it does say less fruits, but if you just 
make sure half your plate is fruits and vegetables. And in October, we're gonna talk about the benefits of, of vegetables. So for, for adults, that's one and a half to two and a half cups a day, depending on your weight and your um, height and all that, your, um, which you can, your BMI and which you, uh, which you can figure out in my plate if you want to. But the most important thing is to just choose a variety of, of, of fruit and eat berries, really eat berries. It's just that important. Mm -hmm. So here's just a little bit about buying and storing, storing them. Um, <clears throat> they should be bright color, blemish free and dry. Don't wash them until you use them because they are a little bit, <coughs> especially the raspberries, a little bit more delicate. If you're gonna refrigerate, um, or freeze berries, uh, you should refrigerate or freeze berries soon after purchase and the way to freeze them. And my brother actually does this in Vermont because he goes during the height of blueberry season because there are a lot of blueberries up there. And he, you put a, like a, a pan uh, with a, a tray with sides of, so I guess it's more like a cookie pan. Um, and you put a single layer and you just place the tray in the freezer until they're solid. And then you put them in an air airtight container and I've done it and it, it's really pretty good. Of course, they get a little mushy when they defrost, but, um, and you should wash them first, but the ones you get from the store are already pre-washed. Um, okay. So, let me go down here. Where's my, there it is. Okay. So what's what's the message here? Eat berries all year round. And although fresh berries are the favorite of most, we can eat berries year round by buying. You can pry them, buy them, or you can do your own freezing. Um, the freshest, of course, is going to have the best nutrient value. And when you buy them fresh, you know, and in season, that's going to be your best bet. But that's not always possible. Um, dry berries are also an option. And look for those with no added sugar and also eat them in moderation because they're concentrated and they're a lot higher in calories. Um, and then we're gonna talk about just quickly, what about juice? So just know that juice is liquid calories and it does provide some nutritional benefit, but because of the high amount of calories, it's recommended that you choose juice in moderation, maybe only eight ounces a day or less. And researchers also think that our brains do not register juice in the same way that it registers solid calories. So you might overeat and you might not compensate for the, uh, the empty calories of the juice because it doesn't have, it has a lot of sugar and not that much else. Uh, they'll might have nutrients and, and polyphenols and things. So, and they found that people who consume sugary beverages don't compensate, as I said, for the higher amount of calories and they, they by eating less solid food. So it could actually end up causing you to gain weight. Whole fruit mm -hmm. is always a better choice because you know everything, and, and when you pull the juice out, there are synergistic things that happen within the whole fruit that might not be happening in the juice. Um, and as you process anything, including fruits, the more you process it, the less, the more loss of nutrients there are. So eight ounces a day is, is really, I have 100% juice with no sugar added is really the recommendation. And really when you're thirsty, you should always drink water first and then, you know, you can go to that. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about organics in each one. Um, everything organic must be certified. There's a list of allowed and prohibited substances. It, the focus of an organic program is good soil quality and plant health so that there's a lot of sustainability in what they do. And just because something comes from, does not come from this country doesn't mean, and, it, and it's labeled organic, doesn't mean that it is uh, not organic. There is the Quality Assurance International, which is USDA accredited certifying agency that verifies the organic integrity of, um, of everything. So, these are places where you can get additional information. If you want to learn more about them in a healthy diet, there's the, my plate, but um, fruits, and, fruits and Veggies for Better Health site is a great site for all kinds of um, information about fruits and veggies and, and antioxidants and polyphenols and things like that. If you're interested in wild blueberries of Maine, that's where you can find out more information about wild blueberries. And if you're interested in more information about berries and cancer um, prevention, as well as berry recipes, you can go to the American Institute for Cancer Research as well. And I guess we, I answered most of your questions. If you have more, Claire, feel free. Mm. You have the benefit of working with me. And Barbara, if you have questions, yeah. I'll, I'll look up the stuff we talked about. If you have any more questions, let sure. me know. So, oh, yeah. 
Okay. It was interesting. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Really I'm was. Sorry that I rushed through that last part there. So maybe I'll just send you my notes so that you can see them. <laughs> um, so sorry. the next thing I'm doing October 3rd is bringing vegetables to the table. And it's also, it's going to basically be the same structure, knowledge about vegetables, historical processing prep tracks, understanding current research and health benefits and, and identifying recommendations. So okay. thank you very much for your patience. Thank um, you. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you liked it. And I will just bid you all adieu. Okay. Time. 